Last time on Graveyard Cars. The 1971 Cuda tribute car that I introduced recently is about to have its final metal work done on it. If we can get a manufacturer to build some of the inner structure pieces for the roof that they're not building right now, we could build a car out of a catalog. You're going to virtually see this car be built before your eyes. Without a doubt, this is the most intricate build we've ever done. This station will remain on the air on this episode. We're trying to make this car look exactly like a real Hemi Cuda. This is the very first car we've ever built from the ground completely up. Social media, the world loves Doug, but you don't know what it's like working with this guy. It does look like nail polish. Oh, no. That copy get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a bat now. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. Got one dog. And his cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. So what I'm doing right now is I have two qualified good helpers in Michael and Noah. We were kind of falling behind out there in the mud room and come to find out Michael's a great mud guy. But to get the most out of somebody, competition's always the best. So they're a good group of guys, but you do kind of play them against each other because each one wants to outdo each other, which the end result is just a quicker, better quality job here at the shop. Michael's nickname, we started that with meat sweats. Uh, that's all he eats. Will calls me meat sweats only because of one time Year ago, seasons ago, I rusted one car because it was a hot summer day and I didn't have any gloves on. And ever since then, it's just said I got meat sweats and the name's just stuck and that's just Will. Noah jumps in, DP90s it, because paint won't stick to metal without the DP90. I have the paint mixed up already, just because we haven't gotten to that point yet. So he just goes in there, DP90s them, paints them, and then uh, we're good to go on those. Then it's about three coats of the single stage, and we spray the Hemi orange on it. We have a special Hemi orange on these, so we mix it up, we just hold the metallic out of it. You know, all the Hemi orange cars we do has that metallic in it. On these, it's not supposed to, so we actually have a batch made up, ready to go, no metallic in it. Three coats on these, and then they're done. So one of the cars that I brought in here last summer to do some restoration work was this 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. So in the world of super rare, it's not the rarest one. They made 2,570, 383 four-speed 70 Challenger RTs. This is a four-speed car. This car is wearing most of its original paint. It's very similar to a couple of cars that I drug out of the Sutherland, Oregon area 15, 20 years ago with the same symptom. This thing got popped in the nose and it got popped hard and took the whole front end off. One frame rail's still hanging on the car, but the rest of it all got ripped off and destroyed. The gentleman brought me the car to do just the body and the paintwork. We're gonna fix the front end on it. We're gonna put the pieces back where they belong. We're gonna do all the body work, the metal work, the mud work, paint it, assemble it, put the windows in it so they roll up and down like they're supposed to, put the back glass in it and the headliner. That's what we call a body in paint. So at that point, he can take it home and put his engine, transmission, drive trains, and all that stuff, the interior. He can build out the whole car himself. He's a mechanical guy. He just doesn't have the ability to do all of the body in the paint, and especially in this particular case, the structural repairs. So this is the area you can see that they removed the left-hand frame rail. All the spot welds are drilled out. You can see here where the frame rail, when it got hit that way, it also went up in the air. That's how I have a dent right here. So based on the fact that this back baffle is puckered right here, the frame rail is that way, and this kink right here, I can tell that the impact on this car is this way. So when you're looking at a car like this, if you take your time and you have some experience in the business, you can almost figure out what happened to it by looking at the direction things went during the primary part of the impact and then the adjacent things that are part of the secondary part of the impact. So here's a great example of Newton's theory of opposition. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. See these dents? Those dents don't come from a hammer. That's from the drivetrain that was in this car when it got hit. Because when it got hit and went up and stuffed that rail over, the engine was sitting still at the time of the accident. When it got hit, it banged over off of the right-hand floor opening and back into the center again. That's what caused that dent, is inertia. 
The secondary damages are the things that happen as a result of that trauma. It could be the engine and transmission, for example, in a hit like that. They're suspended in rubber. It's a rubber motor mount, it's a rubber transmission mount. Rubber has flexibility. The car stopped suddenly, but that engine kept moving. So it would have damage to the right frame rail in addition to the impact, but then it would come back because it's made out of rubber and bounced off the left frame rail, and it could have hit the center tunnel with the transmission. Secondary damages aren't just limited to an engine and transmission. For example, if you go back to our 1971 Phantom Cuda, the one that started it all. And you look at that animation, that's a good example of how primary and secondary damage work. That car got hit so hard in the right front corner that the roof actually buckled. It went so high in the nose that when you look at pictures of it, you can see that there is a dish in the roof. That's secondary damage. There is a dent right here in the rocker. As you can see that, see how far in that's caved right there, the bottom of the rocker and the side. I can promise you that's secondary damage from the front end. Because this would be a hard one to put in there without wiping out the entire side of the car. But if it got stuffed into a ditch and knocked into a rock or a wall, it would cause that. Same thing for the pinch weld. Why is that pinch weld all wadded up? Because that car was flying sideways. If you look here, this is a nice flat frame rail, both sides, nice and flat, no kinks, no puckers from this baffle back. But if you see that kink right there in the baffle, that normally is flat. And the only way that get pinched up and come this way like that is because that frame rail is over that way. But it's over here, it's not over back here. I don't see any spot welds pulled out of the floor. That means I've got a kink in the rail and right there's your kink. Because that metal's gotta go somewhere, right? That's exactly where it bent over at. So on the 1971 Hemi Cuda hardtop, we're trying to make this car look exactly like a real live Hemi Cuda. So other than the vehicle identification number, you will never know the difference between this car and a real Hemi car. This is a good example of what a factory engine, but a little bit better would be. One of the things I've enjoyed a lot uh, this season and last season was watching Doug and Alyssa work together because Doug is a better teacher than I am from the standpoint is he's not a smart ass. He's not always going for the joke like I do. He's very, very professional with her and respectful of her. And he really does try to spoon feed her the stuff that's second nature to him. So in the early days, the engines had uh, solid lifters with adjustable rockers. Well, this one is really unique because it has hydraulic lifters and adjustable rockers, but I believe this is gonna be the first time that Alyssa and I go through the adjustment of the valve train together, and this should be a lot of fun. So I've already cranked the engine around to where it's on top dead center, number one, and here on the damper, I've got the zeros lined up for yep. TDC, top dead center compression stroke, number one cylinder. Now you remember the engine cylinder orders. Yeah, they hop correct? back and forth, uh -huh. so it's, one, three, five, seven, and two, four, six, eight. Phenomenal. Since we're all set up and ready to adjust, let's go ahead and refer to the book and see how we're gonna do these steps. Oh, you already got it open? Yes. We're starting here at B. Set the crankshaft so number one is at TDC compression stroke, and we're gonna adjust number two and number seven intake valves. Okay, that sounds good. And we're gonna keep track of it on this sheet as we do it. Okay. Here we go. So, two. Yep and seven. Intake. What we're gonna do is we're gonna back the adjusting screw off until we have some free play in the push rod. Okay. So I'm gonna start running this adjusting screw down until we get to zero lash. Okay. So zero lash is when it gets hard to spin that because I've got all the play out of the rocker. So I've okay. got it backed off and you can feel some play, right? Yeah, slides back and forth pretty easily. Yeah. So now I'm gonna turn it down until I feel it touch, which is right about there. there, I believe. No free play, right? Nope. We don't want any up and down play. We want all the slack out of the adjustment here. So once you've got it, all the free plays out of that, all I have to do now is turn that screw one and a half turns. Okay, so once it once you feel that it, it hits the bottom, uh -huh. one and a half turns. Right. And then it's right where you want it? That's it, lock okay. it down. How do you know down. if it's gone too far? I just back it up and I retry it until it feels like I've just barely got any pressure on that. Feels good, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I've got little red marks on these and I'm gonna turn it one and a half turns. Here's my little mark right there at the top. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm gonna what start. What happens my... if you over tighten these? 
if you over tighten these, you're gonna have valves that are partly open and you're not gonna have good compression. Okay, will it blow your engine eventually? That won't blow your engine. It's just not gonna run as good. Okay. You'll notice the difference. So what happens if you don't tighten them down far enough? So if you don't tighten these to the mm -hmm. correct specs, they're gonna rattle. They're gonna make a lot of noise. Is that why you have to do uh, certain numbers before others? The reason we're doing this order is because every time we rotate this, it turns the camshaft lobes away so that these are as loose as you can get them for adjustment. Okay, so we've done number two, two intake. Which I'll mark off so just two. So put a two. check next to that. Done that. Now we need seven intake. So over here. Yeah. Uh-huh. You want to back it off? Here's your okay. Allen wrench. So unscrew it until we have some slack in it and then tighten it down until you feel it bottom. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll lock, we'll turn it one and a half turns now. Can okay. you see the red dot I on can. it? I can, so it's straight at the bottom. So now we're gonna go, okay. Okay. Straight up, it started straight down, the uh -huh. red dot. So I took it one and a half. Okay, so great, perfect. Okay, so now we'll lock the jam nut. So the jam nut is what holds the adjusting screw in place. It locks it down so it can't back off. If it backs off, you'll hear it. It'll get really noisy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we've got number seven intake done. Do you think this engine smells like a wet dog? <laughs> yeah. What, what is I that? I do. I thought that was you for a while. No, it was not me. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, the sheepdog's gone. <laughs> <laughs> So now we've done our two intake valves, and the intake valves are closest to the intake ports where the fuel goes in. The exhaust valves are on the outside closest to you, which is the exhaust ports on the outside of the head. Exhaust rockers are on the outside. So now we're gonna we're gonna okay. do number four, exhaust. For exhaust, okay. Uh -huh. What are these called? And how come they're purple? Because I can tell those aren't original. What are these? Yeah, they're cool, but... They don't look like original equipment, do they? These are called rocker shaft towers, and they hold the rocker shafts in place. These are from Mancini Racing. Mark loves their parts. They're made out of billet aluminum. How come they're purple? Why? Racers like pretty things. <laughs> I don't know. They're just, <laughs> that's just the color they powder coated well, them or whatever I finish like the they put on them. Guys like all their stuff to be shiny and pretty and, you know, colorful, right? Yeah. Well, they're definitely back in the 70s with your guys' uh, <laughs> all the colors you guys liked on your cars. Yeah, we, we did. We, we certainly did. We loved them. It was groovy. We, we still do. Groovy? No. I don't that's a, think we. That wasn't what you guys used? What was what was cool? What does my dad use for cool? Hey. What? <laughs> right? <laughs> the Fonz, right? <laughs> you don't know who that is? Well, I've heard of it, but he's a, his impression looks different oh, than yours. I know, I'm, I'm bad. No, you're not that bad. My dad's crazy. He fully commits to the character. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number eight, exhaust done. Okay. Great. Now we rotate the crankshaft 180 degrees in normal running direction. Okay, so we're gonna rotate the engine 180 degrees. Yes. So I've marked the other side of the damper right here. Okay. So all I have to do is rotate it around half a turn. To the zero? To our zero mark, exactly. Okay. So. I like your marks, your red marks that you took the time to do. That makes it. I can see them. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> The guy has already drilled out all the spot welds for the cowl panel because he knows this has to come off to be able to repair the firewall. So I'll just lift that off of there right now and set it down. This is what it looks like inside there. This is the plenum area in between the upper cowl panel and the firewall. It's really hard to see again because this is a big piece of sheet metal. It already has lots of kinks and turns and bends. Hard to know what's there. Even I have a hard time knowing should this be there, should it not be there. That's why we have comparisons out back. But some things I can look down on and I can see that the master cylinder area stoved in. This kink right here should not be here in this firewall. This should be flat right here. You'd never be able to get this to hold the bulkhead. This is real solid though. A lot of times these are rotted out, especially around these. They rust a lot. These are the cold air vents. When you're inside the car and you pull that little handle that says vent, it opens up this plenum to take the air through that cowl into there and put it inside the, the compartment of the car. Both sides the same way. 
you add air conditioning, it uses a different system than that. Here's a lot of the factory seam sealer that they did put on. That's what's left of this white crusty stuff here. <clears throat> that was something that went on before the panel got spot welded into place. You can see it around the windshield, real ugly, but that's okay. You couldn't see it once it was on the car, but it would help protect it. So the most important reason why we're not gonna put a new upper cowl panel on this car, and we're gonna have to save this one, is because the key numbers that make this a real RT are in this panel, right here. Those are the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number. They are stamped in at the factory. It isn't really hidden very well, but it is a hidden body number. You can always tell when these have been manipulated. They have a very minor low spot to them from the stamping. Those numbers are clean. The ones look like the letter I. Everything about that is righteous as rain, just, just as good as it can be. So when you're talking about hidden body numbers, we've talked about this before, but if you're new to the show, I'll explain it one more time. There's a car that's described as a complete numbers matching car. That means that the vehicle identification number on the title matches the vehicle identification number on the information label on the driver's door in 71. The hidden numbers on the upper cowl panel match that title and that door. And the numbers on the radiator support match the title and the door and the cowl numbers. Then you go to the engine. The vehicle identification number is still stamped in that engine that matches all those things and the transmission. And you should technically have the fender tag there with the vehicle identification number on it. That is a complete numbers matching car. Now, we don't take every car on in the world that's brought to us. I, I mean, the, it isn't that I don't want to fix every car, but there's a lot of things that play into it. I mean, the amount of money that it costs to do. Is it justified if it's a 318 car? Probably not. But in this particular case, I'm invested in seeing this car come back to life because it does have the original engine, the original transmission, the original cow with the hidden numbers in it, the original upper radiator support. It's wearing its original paint. The floors are in really nice shape. I mean, if it hadn't been for this accident, whenever it happened that took the nose off of it, this car could probably still be on the road today. So in my mind and in my heart, I think the right thing to do is make it as affordable as possible for the guy and get him back his car in paint. All right, let me tighten down. Okay, All so right. you got it. That's yeah. it. We did it. We're done? Yeah. Hey, that was nice. That really went smooth with your help. Keeping track of everything the way you did with all the reading and writing and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. No so we did it. Yeah. Nice. Well, that wasn't too hard at all. It wasn't, I mean, was the it? book was definitely helpful letting you know which yeah. numbers, yeah. but it wasn't hard. You could do this. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You so much. Anytime. Here, I'll hand you back the tools. Really? I mean, I'll keep them. One other favor. Mark got this intake system we have to put on this thing. Yeah. And there's a lot of reading. Could you help me with that? You said any time. Sure. Well, yeah, yeah. Mark and I have no idea how to install this. My dad doesn't know how to do this either. That's what he, he says. Out here. Maybe you could help us with oh it. Oh my God. Okay. Thank you. Can't say no. <laughs> ah. Thank you. The 1966 Dodge Charger was really a revolutionary car. It was luxurious. The interior was even more luxurious four bucket seats, fold down panel that separated the trunk from the main compartment. You could actually sleep in the back of this car. It had an electroluminescent dash. That meant that at night it looked like the instruments glowed in the dark. It was also one of the first cars to feature hideaway headlights. You could get other options if you wanted to pay more, but those were standard. What option could you not get in a 66 Charger regardless of how much money you had? Was it speed control? power windows, air conditioning. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the commercial break. We'll find out together. So welcome back, everybody. How did you do on that one? The 66 model cars and the 67 models, I'm a little soft on those too. So I'm gonna give you a pass if you guess wrong here. I won't be my quintessential sarcastic self. What option could you not get in a 66 Charger, regardless of how much money you had? Air conditioning, power windows, speed control. If you guessed air conditioning, you're wrong. You could get air conditioning, unless you had a 426 Hemi, then you couldn't get air conditioning. But otherwise, that option was available. If you guessed power windows, you were wrong again. In fact, I've seen quite a few 66 Chargers with power windows. Remember, those were a fairly luxurious little car. If you guessed speed control, 
then you'd be absolutely right. You could never get the 66 Charger with speed control. I don't know how much people cared about speed control in 1966. Wasn't the speed limit like 200? You just keep your foot down. That's what the old timers tell us. I, don't know. I always obeyed the law myself, personally. More of an angel, a little halo on me. Okay, so today what we're working on is putting the intake manifold on the Hemi engine with the fuel injection system, and it's kind of new to me. So all we're gonna do is put the intake on, take the throttle bodies off, and we're gonna tape everything up and get it ready for paint. Now again, when it comes to building this engine out, we want it to look and function as close to factory as possible, except that the owners wanted fuel injection. The fuel injection system that we chose was an Edelbrock. The intake manifold, at a glance, looks very similar to a factory intake manifold. Obviously, there are differences in it, but it's the same profile. The reason we're putting this on now is because we want to get it painted with the engine. And so we're gonna bolt the intake on, take the throttle bodies off, get it all ready for paint, and then we're gonna ship it down to Will. Is the reason why we're putting the manifold onto the engine and then sending it off to Will to be painted, is that how they did it in the factory? Or is that how my dad would like us to do it today? Well, that's the way they did it from the factory. The intake was painted with the engine and this is gonna look like a factory original setup as far as when the hood goes down on this, you're not even gonna tell that those are underneath the shaker hood. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real low profile system. It's gonna look really original. So can you explain to me how the fuel injection system works with the engine? Uh, if, you want, if you want to know anything about this stuff, ask your dad. So the reason that folks went with fuel injection is the same reason people are putting late model Mopar performance crate engines in the cars. They're a lot less maintenance than the old school carburetors were. So an old school carburetor, it's a very mechanical system and it worked great for many, many years. It's all we had too. There's a little plunger that goes up and down in there. When you step on the gas, that little plunger forces gas through the veins of this carburetor and out these little jets. That's the accelerator pump. So when you're sitting at an idle and you step on the gas, that gets the car moving. The accelerator pump goes bad, so all of a sudden the car stumbles when you hit the gas in the beginning or you can't get it started when it's cold. Fuel injection gets rid of all that. It's all a computer that's controlling it. It just shoots the right amount of fuel in that that engine needs based on the information that the computer is feeding to it. It's a sophisticated system. And with the Edelbrock system, it allows me to be able to put it on a car and make it look exactly the way the car would have been from the factory, but with today's technology. So it's a maintenance-free induction system for a 71 Hemi Cuda. So I've already got the gaskets high tacked in place on the heads. I've got the end rail gaskets glued down. I've got some right stuff in the corners. So all we have to do now is get some high tack around the gasket surfaces on top. And then I'll set the intake on. We'll put the screws in and we'll bolt it down. Easy. Yeah, okay. that's, that's what you said. We get to play with this good stuff again, right? Yeah, that's not too bad. No? It's just sticky. You don't think so? Okay, so is that is that too thick or does that look good? Yeah, go right across everything. Rub it down to where it's thin. Like that? Perfect, And yeah. do I go across the... All the way. We have the intake ready. I've got the torque wrench ready. It's like nail polish. Nail polish. <laughs> so nail like... polish, huh? Nail polish. Oh, no! Okay, it does look like nail polish. It's a beautiful color. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Okay, so our 71 Hemi Cuda Tribute is coming along nicely. Here's what we've done in the way of welding. Welding means it's not moving again, it's the final stuff. So we have our front and rear frame rails, torsion bar cross member, those are all set up the other day. The trunk pan is welded in place. The under seat pan is welded in place. We have the front leaf spring hangers installed. Now, those do two things. They connect the frame rail in the rear to the rocker, that gives it its strength in the rocker. Plus it has the four holes in it for the leaf spring hanger at the front of the leaf spring. So we have those installed on both sides. The rockers are installed. The frame rail to rocker reinforcement plates, there's three pieces that make those up. Those are installed. And we just finished installing the A-pillar for the right-hand side. We're gonna do the A-pillar for the left-hand side here shortly. Now it's really important to make sure that the A-pillars go exactly in space where they belong. If that A-pillar is leaning too far forward, too far back, too far out or too far in, you can't put any of the other pieces on it. You can't get the roof to align up to it. You can't get the door to go on and have a good fit against the quarter. The fenders won't fit the doors. So making sure, measure, 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 three, four, five, ten times, because every time you weld something, it can move a little bit. 
Make sure those A-pillars are exactly where they go in space before they get locked down. So all we have left now as far as floor work goes is the main floor pan and the step wells. We're gonna put those in next. Once we have the A-pillar and the inner and outer wheelhouses at the very back, we can bring our roof section in and set it down and that thing will start looking like a car. We just go right in. We've already pre-fit this several times to get the heights of the frame connectors. So this should just go in and set down fairly nicely. Like that. So we line those two up right there. And you should have your screw hole right here. Looks like. Beautiful. Let's go set the other side. Beautiful. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have George go ahead and weld up these farthest to the inside holes right here on both sides. That'll establish that it's down tight against the transmission cross member. At that point, we'll go back and put our step wells in, our rear foot wells, set those up to height because as you can tell, this thing moves all over. So we don't want to start welding it against the side over here until we know that it's the right trajectory from the under seat pan all the way over to the main pan. So we've got to establish some kind of a value and that value is going to be the main floor pan to transmission cross member. Your dad really gets on me to check things real carefully. Feels pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna set it right over the dowel pins on the ends. Tell me how we're looking. Good. Oh, it needs to come over a little bit right there. Right there. Okay, yeah, so we got nice. it. It's in place. Looks good. Looks good. All right, now what we're gonna do is drop all the bolts in all the holes so there'll be eight on each side, and we're, we're gonna be really careful that we don't drop anything into this engine while we're working. Okay, so now we'll just use this to run them down. So as soon as we get this all snug down, we're gonna go ahead and torque them down. Torque down or torque? Torqued. Okay, thought you were gonna about to torque for me, Doug. Wasn't sure. Huh? Thought you were gonna torque for me. I wasn't sure. I can. Do you know what that is? Twerk? Yeah, like twerking. I don't. That's a dance. Oh, uh, you know I can't dance. <laughs> so speaking of twerking, or twerking or t whatever it is. Do you want to see what twerking actually is? The sure. type of dance I don't think you've ever seen before. Okay. Okay, Jeffrey. Let's check this out. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> you don't think you could do that? No, ma'am. Your knee's a little no, too stiff. No, ma'am. Yeah, my knee's too stiff. It's not for everyone. Whoa, lady. Whoa. Finish Let's get it. back to work, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no twerking here. It'd be funny to see you try, though. I don't have my Frankenstein boots. Okay. Neither does your dad. <laughs> what we're doing is compressing those end gaskets right now. That's the okay. cork gaskets on the end. See how yours are going back? They're going further down. Uh huh. So let's go over it again. Okay. Start in the middle and work your way out. We're just trying to bring it down to where the end gaskets are compressed. <laughs> This intake is a little bit different because the, the cast iron intakes we normally put on, they take bigger bolts and they set in a little better than this does. This is really taking a lot of time because the torque setting is so light and to compress this gasket, I wanna bring it down evenly before I start torquing it down. So we're gonna start at a real low torque setting. Okay. We're gonna start in the center. This is gonna be a real tedious job. Okay, so we're just bringing it down real slowly. Okay, you wanna try your side? Yeah. Just go real slow. There's 60. Okay. Perfect. So now, I'm gonna take it up to 72. Do you just know these numbers off the top of your head? No, you no. I read the service manual. Oh. <laughs> 
So the main part of the welding is done on the floor. That's what really gets its strength now. Now you've got the rockers tied together with the floor, tied together with the front frame rails. So now you've like got unibody structure on the bottom half of this car. So now we're gonna put in the rear foot wells. The datum plane is very important. It's the height of the frame. In this case, it's a unibody, so it's frame rails and floor pans that make up the structural integrity of the unibody. All right, let's go ahead and set that down. So we'll set this in here. This one overlaps on that. You'll wanna pay attention to how it's supposed to be. But again, you can see how low our floor pan is. In this particular case, you've got a floor pan that sags in the middle, all right? And the step wells, same thing, they sag in the middle. There's nothing under them. The sides are fine. They're setting on the frame rails and on the rockers, but getting the datum plane and the height of the floor pan is very important. That's why we roll a jack underneath there. We set everything in place. And you watch as we slowly jack up the center of that floor pan inside the tunnel. And as it raises up, you'll see all of the pieces come together. The step wells begin to fit and curve around the tunnel like it's supposed to. And when that's done, we take a measurement to make sure that the datum plane, the height, is exactly where it's supposed to be. Once it's where it's supposed to be, while it's under a load, we weld everything up. So, so far, everything's gone really well. Uh, we're doing a combination of plug welding and spot welding. And the reason for that is the manufacturer, when they built these, they had different equipment than we did. So our spot welder, it's a great spot welder. The AIM had it for years, good old workhorse, but it doesn't get in everywhere that the factory ones could. So in those cases, we have to do a plug weld. We drill a hole, the metal underneath it is pressed tightly against the panel that we're welding to it. We fill it with MIG. So. Those are a plug weld, the spot welds you can see. What's really fun about this is when you look at the trunk floor and under seat pan and the things that we could really do a lot of spot welding on, it's so cool to look at that because it's exactly the way the manufacturer did. So when you step back now and look at this car, you're gonna have a hard time knowing exactly how many pieces are new on it. Little do you know, almost every piece is new on it. This is the very first car we've ever built from the ground completely up. So I'm really looking forward to moving to the next step and getting that roof on there. So all we gotta do left, right, is unbolt the, these bad boys and take them off and we're done. One thing I'd like to do first is put the valve covers on just to kind of give us a little more protection against dropping anything down in here. Sound good? Yeah. That's okay. Good. <clears throat> these aren't the right ones, right? These are not correct for this engine. <clears throat> we're just using them for paint. You want to pop that one on there. Just a couple nuts on each side just to hold it in place. Okay. All right. Sounds pretty good. That should keep the paint out. Okay, so now we can go ahead and remove the throttle bodies. The reason we went with this, the intake manifold looks very similar to a factory intake manifold. It also takes throttle body carburetors rather than ported injection. It takes these throttle bodied looking carburetors, if you will. Those allow us to be able to put a factory shaker base on those. Once that factory shaker base goes on, then we can put the shaker assembly on it. Shaker assembly goes on it, you install it in the car, you close the hood down, and you've got what you think is a 426 Hemi dual four carburetor engine. In reality, it's a 426 Hemi with electronic fuel injection. It's a really slick way of marrying old school and new school together. Okay, we did it. It's ready to go to paint. Today we installed the electronic fuel injection manifold and it went great. Not only did I learn something, like I always do when I work with Doug, Doug also learned something. You learned about twerking and I learned about the EFI manifold. Okay. <laughs> no, we had a great day. Everything went really good. Yeah, this, this is the first one of these intake systems we've installed. We're pretty excited about the way it's gonna run. So uh, yeah, we had a good day and I'm glad I didn't call in sick today. Want to see another torque video? Another torque video? Yeah. Yeah. You want to see another torque Why not? video, Jeffrey? Okay, he'll bring the. Oh. Jeff <laughs> <laughs> so we have learned that the Plymouth Superbird is an exceptionally rare bird. That it was built out of necessity to compete at NASCAR in 1970. I have a true or false question for you here to see just how much you really know about the Superbird. True or false, the nose cone and the rear spoiler were both made out of fiberglass to save weight. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break and we will find out together.
Uh, we're still alive. I heard the bomb go off. What happened? Sorry about that, folks. Been having a bit of a rodent problem in the east wing. Thought perhaps I nip it in the bud. <laughs> Take that as a warning, however. I'll give you just one more chance to redeem yourselves. If you fail me again, the next time, the chamber won't be empty. Die Hard 2? What is this? Some kind of revenge? Extortion? You're dead, pal. What more do you need from us? It's not as simple as all that, Mr. McLean. There is a pay phone in the lounge. You and Mr. Gamble will go there, no one else. <laughs> I will call you in five minutes. Failure to answer will cost you non-compliance. Do you understand me, Jim? Oh yeah, I understand. I understand you're a wacko that likes to rip off action movies. That's what I understand. Good. I'll talk to you in five minutes. Well, it looks like we're in this one together, pal. Uh, I'm not expendable. What the hell are you talking about, pal? It's what that lady in the bowl said in uh, first part, part two, uh, necklace. You're not going to believe this, but I'm in this big house right now, and there's this whole group of people here having some kind of dinner party. And one of them is my boss from- Excuse the... us, sir. Excuse us. This is an urgent police matter. We're going to need to commandeer that phone. What are you guys- Ow. Uh, Wait, hey. Uh, uh, Whoa. As I was going to say that, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks. Every sack had seven cats. Every cat had seven kittens. Kittens, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to say that? My number is 555. And the answer. How do you, uh, like the German accent? I, I gotta work on it. I, I do Peter Sellers a little bit better, but, um... Now you have 30 seconds to figure it out, or this place is history. <laughs> oh, Talk about deja vu, pal. So, McLean, I got it. There's the old one guy who was saying, oh, there's another guy who was good. This is the one guy. One. One. He goes, oh, he's two. Two. One. Yeah. It's food, baby. Better go puke. Thanks for the help, pal. But as you're well aware, I don't read. Time's up, buddy. Everybody, duck. There's a bomb. A, uh, another bomb. Pal. Are you guys talking about this bomb? We found it while you guys were out of the room. It's just a dud. <laughs> oh man, this is too easy. I'm getting pretty sick of this shit, pal. Okay, ghouls, how did we do on that one? Now, I don't think we've even talked about this in the past. So if you're familiar with the Superbirds, you already know the answer. If you're not, you're gonna learn something. Now, true or false, the nose cone and the rear spoiler are made of fiberglass. That was to save weight. If you said that's a true statement, it's a great guess, but it's no closer to the truth. The nose cone was made of steel, all of it. It was an assembled unit. It had two sides, a top, and a bottom, all steel. The doors that went in the nose cone, they were made of fiberglass, so give you 10% for being right there. The rear spoiler was a cast aluminum part, so they were trying to save weight, but if you've lifted one of those, they're not a whole lot lighter than the steel would have been back in the day. So, oh, and just so you know, the hood is off a 1970 Dodge Coronet and the extension piece at the front is also made of steel. Both fenders on the Superbird are actually Dodge Coronet fenders modified for a Plymouth Superbird. Rewind that, DVR it, go back, play it a bunch of times. Alyssa and I finally got the engine ready. We're gonna ship this over to Will for paint. All right, Doug. Hey, my good friend Will, how are you? You done with that? Yes, it's ready. Let's go. Where are we going? Mark, I suppose you're gonna take this down lead? there? Yes, let's go. Sweet, okay, this is great. I'm gonna try to get back at Will a little bit because he always gives me a bad time and I got two more engines ready to go for him and let's see if I can pull a trick on Will this time. 
This should have been done two weeks ago. Well, it's been waiting for you. And in the no, process, it hasn't. I got two more for you. If you could, friend. Why do you do that? What do you mean? Why? Why? Well, I know it's been a while, but I got two more ready to go. So I, I need that one ASAP. No, I need Please. it ASAP. That one? Yeah, I need that now. Could you take these two while you're at it? Why do you do this to me? Mark's on my butt to get this one done, and you got three ready? So yeah. you sit around for two months building three engines, doing whatever it is you do. I build engines. And then I got to come over and paint right away. Not Thank only you. to have one, I got to do three. And we know none, none of these are even going to run. Not going to run? Did you build them? Alyssa helped me build that one. Well, that's garbage. <laughs> what about these two? They're ready to go. But do they run? Well, of course they run. Okay, so we're not gonna have any rear main seals leaking, no craziness when these go in the car like normal? That ain't my problem. Well, it's your problem because it's your shared apartment, Doug. Thank you, friend. Okay, so the booth is open. Now, do these actually roll? Yeah. Why'd you hesitate? All right, you follow me and bring the other two, Doug. I gotta go, Will. Now, Doug. I got a phone call. Doug. Your Tony, replacement's a you? phone call away. Hey, lunch. Let's do lunch, Tony. <laughs> oh, my God. So having gone over the entire 1970 Challenger 3 to 3 four-speed car, documented it, inventoried it, already spoken with the owner, uh, we're in a position that I can cut the guys loose to do a disassembly on it. There isn't a lot to disassemble because it is a good portion of it has been disassembled, but there's stuff inside the car and things that need to be put away. Once that's done, it'll go out onto the racking and set in line and get ready to go to the dipper. Eli and I got the Challenger torn apart. Took us all of about 15 minutes. Real quick disassembly here. So we'll get this all off to the dipper and get it cleaned off and bring it back for some uh, body work and uh, hopefully see this car go back together. So in, in typical graveyard cars fashion, as opposed to, hey, let's just build out the one. Let's get it down to Will because it's emergency. Doug doesn't think that way. He says, hey, I'm building one engine. Let's go ahead and build three. It's unfortunate because I try not to get on Doug because I love Doug. My parents love Doug. Social media, the world loves Doug, but you don't know what it's like working with this guy. It takes the simplest task and makes it 10 times harder than what it truly needs to be. So I got two of the engines in here. There was some miscommunication. Out of the three, there were only two that were ready. But that's typical Doug fashion. So not only does he waste the time building all these engines out when I just needed one, he didn't even have that third one ready to go. But I do have two in here. One of them's a Hemi. These things are big, they're heavy. It, it's a lot. But I finally have them. I'm gonna spray two out of the three, get this done, get them back to Doug. Doug's an awkward guy. I gotta learn not to buy in to Doug's silliness because it's not even funny. You know, at least Mark said, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's the same silliness. It's, it's that whole gene pool. They all have that same sense of humor. Half the stuff isn't funny, but it's Doug. Love him to death, heart of gold. End result is, engines got painted, they're back over to him, and we can move forward. <laughs>